The EdTech volunteers are a very interesting bunch. We've got a little cross-section of a whole of engineering and programming of computer industry for, 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 from year dots. When we all got together, the enthusiasm was palpable, really. We, we all wanted to do it, but of course the problem wasn't so much the electronics, it was the organisation. And Andrew was exactly the man to do it. I'm glad I didn't get the job as project manager, actually. My initial um, involvement with EDSAC was to produce with Peter Lawrence a circuit called the Digit Pulse Generator. This is the heart of the machine. The, the valve was a very general purpose amplifying device and uh, everybody used valve. But nowadays, of course, the transistor came along which was a lot more efficient, a lot cheaper, and only rock groups and hi-fi enthusiasts actually use valves now. Okay. The, uh, the supply of valves is, is, was quite critical, we thought at first, but when we, we finally discovered that there were lots of valves about in people's warehouses. Um, the, the difficulty wasn't so much the valves as the valve bases. These units are of now few and far between because the equipment they were placed in has been destroyed. So these have actually come all the way from China, believe it or not. Uh, having completed the 28 different amplifiers, uh, I've been asked to move on to a new section, which is the set of uniselectors here, which produce the initial orders for the computer. The computer needs to be started up with some sort of a program. And this gives the official, the first program for the computer to get it going. It allows it to read in the paper tape of the particular program you want to run. Well, what I'm doing is removing this final connection, and then we can take this uniselector out of the rack and start modifying the wipers. Each unit consists of a set of wipers that select sequentially each one of these pins. Uh, and on here, we've yet to be wired up all the connections that give us the, our basic set of 40 instructions. Well, the uniselector was, is, is the main part of telephone exchanges. As you dialed your dial in the old days, the, this relay came in and out and it selected a particular outgoing line for your subscriber. The way the machine works is, this is a big solenoid, clicks in, and as it clicks in, it moves these wipers around progressively, selecting each one of the pins. On these pins, this next job is to wire up a series of ones and noughts in the right pattern to give us the basic set of instructions. This is the, uh, an appendix to a paper by Wheeler, and it contains the initial, initial orders number two. Um, these are the instructions uh, coming down the side, and this is the location instruction, and this column is the actual instruction itself. Um, the instructions in the machine basically <coughs> consist of one letter followed by a number, and then there's one other digit that says whether it's a small number or a large number. Uh, let's take an example then of uh, something that we can understand perhaps. Instruction number four, which is A39F. I've interpreted this in, into a binary code, instruction four, a39F, which means the letter A, which is then coded as a five bit number, three ones and two noughts, 11100. The 39 is represented by this field, which is a six digit field, one, two zeros, three ones. And the final digit, a one or naught, this is in this case an F, it's a zero. So these are the 17 bits of ones and noughts that we've got to wire up onto these 17 spindles. There are four on each, and we're starting at this end. So instruction four will be the fourth pin up. So this then will hold that instruction, which is add 39 to the accumulator, uh, instruction number four, and each one of these ones and noughts has got to be correctly wired onto the earth. 60 miles away in a small close near Cambridge, Nigel Benner is another. EDSAC volunteer. I first learnt about this project uh, from the Computer Conservation Society down in London um, and found out that the project manager for it, Andrew Herbert, was a local guy just up the road. It soon occurred that one of the problems Andrew was having on the project, which was about a year old at the time, was that they hadn't, although we got a picture of a half adder, there's a picture of the half adder, um, no one knew how it worked or had designed a circuit to, uh, to do the job. But more interesting was the fact that there were 14 racks, each containing a dozen of these chassis. That seemed like quite a challenge. <laughs> and we only had a description of it and some logic diagrams. And there were lots of photographs, undated, so we didn't know when they were. 
Anyway, that, that hooked me. So I said, yeah, I'd look into the half adder, and I did, and I designed it. But I did manage to design it with all the valves in that picture. Right, so what is a half adder? If you look on the, the board here, there's the truth table. So we have two inputs to the half adder, A and B, and the output is either the sum and the carry. If you put in a zero and a zero, you get zero out, no carry. If you put in a one and a zero, or a zero and a one, the sum is one and no carry. If you put in two ones, there's no sum, but there's a carry. So that describes, in logic terms, a half adder. So in today's technology, we'd implement that logic diagram um, with this diagram here, just a couple of gates, an XOR gate and an AND gate, do the job. That is a half adder logically. However, when we try and do it with the uh, 1940s technology, with valves, it takes all of that. And that's because every simple gate takes at least three valves and a couple of diodes. So you'll see that when you translate this into a chassis, you end up with quite a large chassis, as we can see over here. That's a half adder. It's this big. That bit does the carry, that bit does the add, and that synchronizes with the clock. And the various diodes belong to the, um, the AND gates and the OR gates and the DC restoration circuits. There are two of them to make a full adder. So the second adder takes the carry and the result from this one and produces the final answer. Well, the, um, the photograph, the forensics we'll talk about now, because we do have lots of photographs. Unfortunately, one of them was discovered in a book with a date on it. Now this was immensely important for us because it enabled us to effectively date other photographs as well. So we knew we were dealing with the same era. And the fingerprint, as you see over here, these monitor points along the bottom, um, you can see on this image, red and, and black. On the images that we've got, they're in black and white. So some of them, you can infer that they're different colours from the density. On a couple of the high resolution images, you can read the labels on the chassis very, very well. Unfortunately, they're not super descriptive. What is important about them is that you can see these monitor points. I can actually show you how the, how the fingerprinting sort of works. Just to give an illustration, I've put up a few fragments of valve circuitry up there. The, these aren't precise. They're just the typical clumps of valves in uh, three types of circuits. On the left-hand side, um, that's a typical circuit for a buffer or an AND gate or an OR gate. And on the monitor points, you tend to have a red one and a, and a black one uh, corresponding to those two monitor points. Whereas in an amplifier circuit, a long tail pair circuit, you don't tend to have this upper test point, but you do have a test point corresponding to a bias voltage that's being applied at the side. So they tend to be offset like that. And similarly, when you get to a flip-flop, which can have between three and six valves dependent on output, you get a pattern a different pattern, more like this. So there's not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between these things, but there's sufficient difference to give you a clue that this, um, uh, that, that this particular section of the chassis you can see is probably a flip-flop, or it's probably a gate, or probably. And if that ties in with your logic design, then you're happy, because you can say, oh, that's, that's how I would have done it anyway and I can do it, I can, it, it'll look like the original, and it will hopefully work like the original. Having designed the adder circuitry, Nigel is now designing modern test units to simulate the as-yet-missing delay storage memory units. Right, this little circuit here is a 21st century memory tank. There's a little microcontroller on there, and it's basically acting as a store. Now, it's an interim solution until we've got the, uh, the delay line storage working, but it means that the standard memory unit, the memory regeneration unit, of which this chassis, chassis is a typical example, can emulate any size memory from the main memory, which is uh, 576 bits long, all the way down to a 17-bit short um, register for program sequencing. The scope trace at the moment is showing um, a data stream that I'm putting in from some test equipment, which is a series of 101010. The blue trace is the system clock, and what I'm checking at the moment 
is that the data signals are synchronized properly with the clock signals. That's very important on all machines. And I, I show you that by raising the clock signal. You see the clock edge and the data edge there are beautifully synchronized. And what I've been doing at this instant is making a few changes to the resistor values on this circuit. Um, and the idea is to have it, um, when I'm satisfied with it, we'll make a printed circuit board of that and make 10 or 20 of them so that other people who need these memory chassis uh, can have them off the shelf.